If you will, turn in your Bibles to the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John as we continue our study through the Word. You will remember how the disciples had been gathered together after the resurrection there in the uh, upper room and how Jesus had come into the room and blessed them with peace, peace upon you. And you remember that he ministered to them and he breathed his Holy Spirit upon those disciples. And you remember that Thomas was not there. And no doubt the other disciples told Thomas, Thomas, where were you? You cannot believe what happened. It was the Lord that came. And, and they shared with them how the Lord had met with them as a, as a group. And you'll remember Thomas's response. I will not believe you. I will not believe unless I see the imprint of the nail in his hand, unless I take my fingers and place them in the imprint, unless I take my hand and put it into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. Thomas struggled with unbelief. The the other disciples are like, Thomas, come on, it's us. We were there. We saw him. He came. And Thomas would not be moved. He struggled in that place of unbelief, stuck. No doubt that was a difficult week for him. The Bible says that a, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his things. Have you ever been double-minded? Have, have you ever struggled? It's like, you know, maybe we should get a dog. <laughs> no, we should definitely not get a dog. But they are cute. It would be fun to have a dog in the house. But, oh, you have to walk them. We should not get a dog. You have to take care of them. But, I think we should get a dog. <laughs> we can't get a dog. And you go back and forth and you're like, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And it's just this double-minded place. That's just with a dog. <laughs> Thomas was stuck there with the Lord. They said they saw him. <laughs> I should believe them. They said that he was here. No, I, I will not believe. He is not alive. I cannot allow myself to believe that he is alive. But if he is alive and, and they saw him, and, and what does that mean? I am not going there. I will not, I will not believe. I will not believe. And he stayed in this place. It is a hard place to be stuck between belief and unbelief of, of what by faith we receive by what sight is telling us. And there are times when sight and faith can put us into a great battle of uncertainty. That is the battle that Thomas experienced. And he stayed in that place for a week. It was the next week when Jesus once again made his way there, you'll remember, and peace to you and instantly what does he do he goes to thomas i love that about the lord there was a group of disciples but who does jesus go the hurting one the one that is burdened the one that is struggling and suffering and and he ministers right to thomas i feel in the exact same way the lord comes and ministers to us there was a group of disciples there's a group of us here today and but the Lord knows exactly who is hurting, who is sorrowful, who is suffering, who is struggling. And, and the Lord meets us right there. The Bible tells us that where two or more are gathered, the Lord is there with us. And, and the Lord has come to put a touch on every single one of us and to meet you just exactly at your greatest point of need and, and whatever it is that you need, whether it is a strengthening today, or a, a comforting today, or a washing and a cleansing, or whether you need a restoring, or whether you need a building up and encouragement. The Lord knows just exactly where you're at and what you, what you need. 
He comes in peace again upon the disciples, but instantly to Thomas. Thomas, come here. Look with your eyes the imprint that you wanted to see. Touch it, Thomas, with your hands. You wanted to put your fingers into the very wound. And Thomas, here is my side. Place your hand in my side. Those were the three things that Thomas said that he was not going to be able, not willing to believe unless he did those three things. And those are the three things that the Lord instantly ministered to Thomas with. And you'll remember Thomas's response. My God, my God. And you remember how Jesus said to him, Thomas, blessed are you, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those that never see and do believe. And, and so we see how Jesus met Thomas right where he was at, struggling in his belief and unbelief, and, and he sets him back on his feet, stands him up, ministers to him, and, and blesses him. I'm so thankful that the Lord does that for each and every one of us. John went on then afterwards to record that there were many things that, were, that are written that are not written in this book, but the things that are written in this book are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so we see that John tells us why he wrote this gospel. There, there were the other three synoptic gospels, and he wants us to know that he didn't write this gospel just to add in some nice details, to fill in some gaps, to accentuate the, uh, the gospel narratives that were already there, but he wrote it with a specific purpose, and he tells us that purpose right after we saw the Lord minister to what? To the unbelief of Thomas. Just as I wrote this for one reason, that you might believe. Whatever your condition of faith was coming into the gospel of John, John wants to walk you all the way through so that you can put to rest any doubt that you have, any struggle that you've got, or any place in which you can be battling in unbelief. He's going to close the gospel now dealing with Peter. Do you remember how Peter had failed the Lord, how he had declared that he didn't even know Jesus and, and that just absolutely crushed and devastated Peter? We're going to see that Jesus is now going to meet with the disciples and corporately together. It will be the third time since his resurrection that he got together with the group. It was on Resurrection Sunday that night in the upper room that he met with them. It was a week later with Thomas that he met with them. That was the second time. And, and this is now going to be the third time that he meets with them collectively. He <coughs> had met with Peter privately on resurrection on Sunday, but not in corporately. And, and as Thomas had struggled with his belief, Corporately, Jesus came and ministered to his struggle, personally, but corporately. And as Peter had publicly declared that he would never deny the Lord, we are going to see that Jesus is going to meet with Peter corporately, but minister to him privately as well. And we will see the restoration of Peter here in this final chapter. It begins verse 1, after these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And so the seven of them, you'll remember that they had been in Jerusalem for the resurrection, and then they stayed there that week. That was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was the, the following Sunday that now Thomas uh, and the Lord appears to him. And Jesus then tells them to depart from Jerusalem and to go to Galilee and that he will meet them there in Galilee. You remember those instructions that were given. 
And so the feast has ended now and they head to Galilee and here seven of the disciples are together there in Galilee. He told them to go there and to wait for him. There were 40 days in between the resurrection and the ascension. And so these events are taking place now. And Jesus didn't tell him when he was going to come. Just go to Galilee and I'll meet you there. They didn't know that Jesus was going to ascend in 40 days. They didn't know the, the timeline. <coughs> they were just simply told to head back to Galilee. I wonder what that had to have been like, that journey back. The tumultuous events that had taken place, the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, and, and then his ascension and, or his resurrection and, and the glorious news that, that he's alive. But what does it all mean? Where do we go from here? For the last three years, they followed Jesus. Wherever Jesus went, that's what they did. And, and now Jesus has told them that he's going to be ascending to his Father, that he's going to be departing from them. What about, what about us? What about our future? What do, we, what do we do next? What's the plan? Does anybody have a plan? Does everybody have the plan? Go to Galilee. It's our next step. And they came back to Galilee. What was that like to come back again? Galilee was the same. Same shops, the same people, the same neighborhoods, place that they had grown up, lived in. Hadn't changed, but they had changed. They had radically changed in those years with Jesus. And now what? So they wait. And they wait. And they wait. And then they ate lunch. <laughs> and waited. Till supper. And they waited. Some more. And some more. Waiting's hard. Isn't waiting hard? Have you ever found yourself just waiting just like so ready to just like be over it and to and to get going again and to get moving it and anybody tired of waiting for covid to be over you know just like you know can this just be done already and you wake up the next morning and there's your mask sitting there the reminder you got to wear it when you you go out and it's just this just waiting it's just hard they're up there they're just they're waiting they're waiting for jesus and they have no idea what what the future is going to look like and what's normal going to look like and will life ever get back to normal again is there even a new normal for what they had just gone through but they're back in a familiar environment and peter taps out he's done he's done waiting he says in verse 3, And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. <laughs> the Lord didn't tell him to go to Galilee and go fishing. The Lord told him to go to Galilee and wait for him there. But Peter decides that he's going to go fishing. Now, here's what I want you to know, that when you and I say we're going fishing, that, that means a hobby. That means we're bored. We're going to go do something that's fun and, and we'll enjoy ourselves. But when Peter says he's going fishing, he He's not talking about a hobby. Peter was a fisherman. I'm going back to my old life. He wanted to feel a boat underneath him again. He wanted to smell the sea, feel the wind on his face. He wanted to busy himself with the activity of taking the nets and throwing them over and hauling them in and bringing them in. 
You see, he had had an opportunity with the Lord, but he had denied the Lord. And even though the Lord's alive, no doubt he's got no place, no use for someone who denied that he even knew him. So I got to come up with a plan B in, in my life. I'm going fishing. I'm going back to the world. I'm going back to what's familiar. I'm going back to what I knew before Jesus. And they said to him, we're going with you also. And they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught what? Nothing. nothing. Is that a surprise? The world has nothing for you once you've walked with the Lord. The world never had anything for you even before the Lord. I want you to notice something. The others said they're going with him also. I want you to know when leaders make good decisions, people follow them in those good decisions. I want you to know when leaders make bad decisions, people follow them in those bad decisions as well. You see leaders lead and they influence the people that are around them. And I want you to know that every single one of us has a level of influence as well. Parents, the footsteps that you lay down, feet are going to follow behind you how important it is that those footprints lead us towards Jesus and not away from Jesus because people are impacted by you, by your faith, by your decisions, by how you live and how you walk. And just because Peter now is making a bad decision, we don't see them all now making the right decision. We see them following right behind leadership of Peter. But when morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus is there. If you ever wonder if Jesus has a sense of humor, just go back to this verse. I love this. He's on the shore now. They fished all night, but he doesn't let them know that it's him. And so as the fishermen would be fishing at night and they would come in in the morning, villagers, if you were there where the boat was, you could buy fish from the fishermen. You didn't have to go to the market. You could get it right from the fishermen right there on the boat. And so Jesus now is standing on the shore and they're finishing up. They're done for the night. They've got nothing. And, and now as they come, verse 5, then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? In other words, hey, did you catch anything? Can I buy anything from you guys uh, here this morning? And they answered him, no. <laughs> Fishermen tend to not be in a good mood if they haven't caught fish. They've been toiling all night. They didn't catch anything. And, and here now they're being asked, you know, by a person on the shore, hey, did you, did you catch anything? And they're like, no. And I love this, verse 6. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. <laughs> I want you to picture yourself. You've been fishing all night. You're coming in. There's a person standing on the shore. And they said, hey, did you catch anything? You say no. And they said, you know why? Because you didn't cast the net on the proper side of the boat. Just try it on the other side. You're going to catch fish. Thanks. <laughs> Everyone's an expert. You see, they fish at night because at night the fish come up mm, to the surface and so their shallow net and mm, casting can catch the fish because they're up at the top feeding. When the sun comes up and the heat starts to rise, the fish dive down deeper. They've been fishing all night. Peter grew up fishing. He's the captain of a ship. Mm. And here's a person telling him that he threw the net on the wrong side of the boat. Just throw it on the other side. You'll catch fish. And I love this. So they cast. Why did they do that? Why did they listen to somebody on the shore telling them that they just happened to have thrown the net on the wrong side of their boat? I believe it's because the echo was in Peter's head. You remember when Jesus was preaching on the shore, the Sea of Galilee, and the crowds became so big that 
Jesus got into Peter's boat and pushed back so that he could now speak to the crowds. And, and after he had finished, he told Peter, Peter, push out into the deeper water. And he does. And then he tells Peter, Peter, let down your nets for a catch. And do you remember what he says? Master, we toiled all night long and we have washed our nets and we've put them away. And I know you do that whole preaching thing really awesome, but I know how to catch fish and it's daytime and the fish are down. And if I cast my nets, I'm going to have to wash them again and put them away. And we're trying to go home and go to bed and get some sleep. But nevertheless, at your command, I'll throw the nets. And he's going to show Jesus that it's not how you catch fish. <laughs> and you remember he throws the net, not the nets, but the net. And suddenly there was this miraculous draught of fish in his nets. And you remember that Peter is undone with the divinity now of Christ. And he is suddenly aware of his own sinful nature. When we come into the presence of holiness, when we become aware of holiness, it makes us recognize just how wretched that we are. There's none righteous, no what? No, not one. And when you stand in the light of glory and perfection, we're undone. Peter is undone before the Lord. See, the Lord spoke to Peter in his own language, in the language of fish and fishing, and showed him that he's the Lord. And now here is this person on the beach telling him, just cast your net on the other side. And he doesn't. And it says, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Again, the nets are full. And therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. And so this net now is just filled. <coughs> Peter jumps out and <coughs> he's so eager to get to the Lord. It says in verse 9, and then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So they come and there's a fire and Jesus is there. And, and Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153 and Although there were so many, the net was not broken. So you can just see Peter, he jumps out of the boat, he races to the shore, they get the net, and, and Peter goes and grabs the net and drags it onto the shore. And, and we see here that John tells us that there were 153 large fish. 153. Notice that he doesn't say that there were roughly 150. He gives us the exact number, 153. And that has led Bible scholars throughout the centuries to, to examine that number, 153, to figure out what is the allegorical or symbolic or spiritual significance to 153. St. Augustine said that 153, he was the one that observed that 153, the numbers added together from 1 to 17, if you take 1 to 17, add all those numbers together, it comes out to exactly 153. So 17 then. And 17, he said, was indicative of the Ten Commandments and the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit. And that was Augustine. It's interesting to know that the Greek words Peter and fish, if you take the numerical value of their letters, of P 
Peter and fish and you add them together that that comes out to 153. Cyril of Alexandria says that the 100 stands for the Gentiles, the 50 represents the nation of Israel and the number three is representative of the Trinity, so the 153. But this is what I know. I, I know for absolute certain that the 153 stands for the number of fish that they caught. <laughs> and then that, that's what I know for absolute and certain. They caught 153 fish and John wanted us to know that. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. And Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. And this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they eat breakfast together. No one's talking. Jesus hasn't identified himself, but they know it's the Lord. And, and they're all just sitting there eating and just looking at each other. And so when they had eaten breakfast, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, <clears throat> yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs, Peter. Peter, you're not going back to fishing. You're not going back to what I called you out of. You're not going back to your identity in the world, but you're going to continue to press forwards and, and feed my lambs. He says, Simon, do you love me more than these? What are the these that Jesus referenced? Do you love me, Peter, more than these? Some believe that it's a reference to the other disciples that Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? You remember there was a time when Jesus had told them that they are all going to abandon him, that Peter stood up and said, even if every single one of them leave you, I will never leave you. I will die with you. Peter boasted that he loved the Lord more than anybody else, that he was more loyal and more courageous than the other disciples, and he had said it in front of the other disciples. And now Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me more than these? Some believe that Jesus wasn't talking about the disciples, but instead he pointed to the fish. Do you love me more than these? The 153 large fish was an extraordinary catch for a fisherman. That was a, a record. It meant wealth, success, his identity as a fisherman, his reputation in the world. Do you love me more than all of this? Peter had gotten tired of waiting and went and fishing, and now the Lord gave him this abundant catch, and he said, is this what you wanted? Do you love this more than me? A second time, verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. In order to... Love the Lord, you have to love the things that the Lord loves and the sheep, and the near and dear to the Lord and he commissions Peter to tend his sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter's grieved that he asks him for the third time. He affirms him that third time. 
was a threefold public affirmation, one affirmation to replace each of the public denials that he ever even knew Jesus. In the original Greek language, it is interesting detail that we miss reading our English translations. In the Greek language, there's a lot of different words for the word love. We have just one word. Two of the major words in the Greek language are agape love and phileo love. Agape love is that pure, perfect, sacrificial, unconditional love. That's agape love. Phileo love is that relational love. It's the friendship love. It's I like you because you like me sort of love. And, and that's phileo love. In the Greek language, Jesus, the first time he talks to Peter here, he says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo The second time, Jesus asks him, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, I phileo you. The third time, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you phileo me? Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. It is interesting to me the way in which the Lord is trying to, to lift Peter up, to help him to rise to a deeper level of relational intimacy and connection and, and fellowship. And, and he tries twice, and, and on the third time when Peter is not able to, to step up uh, in his relationship, we see the Lord condescends to meet Peter right where he's at. We'll start right there then, Peter. That's where you're at. And I find that the Lord is the exact same way with you and me. Wherever we are in our relational connection and fidelity and love and with Jesus, where, wherever that is, the Lord will start there and, and he will continue to, to work from that in place. He is always seeking, know this, that we're, we're, whatever level of connection that you walked in here today with the Lord with, whatever that level is, know this, that the Lord's desire is today that you would take one step closer to him than you were earlier today. And if that means not knowing him at all, then, then that first step is getting to know him. And, and whatever level it is, Christ is constantly seeking to help us to draw into a deeper, more abiding, fruitful relationship in, in our life. And, and I love the compassion and gentleness and humility of Christ. Notice there was no condemnation. Notice that there was no reference to his failures whatsoever. And notice that he doesn't say this after the first two agapes and, and after Peter says that he phileos him, that, that Jesus doesn't say, hey, Peter, you know what? You go think about that. When you're ready to agape me, we can get back together again and get this and sorted out. And um, until then, just go and, and pray about it. He doesn't do that. He's just interested in, in the love relationship between the two of them. Do you love me? And then he goes on in verse 18. Most assuredly, I say to you, he prophesies now over Peter. When you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify in God. Peter had boasted that he would be faithful even unto death, and then he turns around and denies that he even knows the Lord. But here Jesus tells him, Peter, you will be true to your word. You will be crucified because of your love for me, and you will remain faithful 
all the way to the end. And he prophesies that faithfulness, that fidelity over Peter and lets him know that he's not going to fail. He's not going to deny him. He will be true to his words. Tradition tells us that mm, Peter was in Rome when he was arrested, that he was sentenced to be crucified, and that mm, Peter asked to be crucified upside down because he said that he's not worthy to die in the same fashion in which his Lord died. And that's what tradition tells us. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And <coughs> Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? I'm talking about John. And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You see, in church tradition, in the early church, they, John was the last living apostle, and there was a, a rumor that the Lord was going to return before John died. So every time John got a sniffle or a sneeze, it's like, oh, the Lord might be coming now. Look at he's getting sick. And, and so there was all of this commotion over John's health, and John wanted, wanted everybody to know that Jesus never said that he was coming back. He said... If I will that he remains alive, what is that to you? You follow me. And he, he clears that up and he hears with that detail. And this disciple is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. It's been calculated that if you were to read all the words that Jesus spoke that are recorded in the Gospels that it, out loud, that it would take you about three hours. But if you were to ponder the meanings of Jesus' words that are recorded and to write commentaries uh, upon them, they would be absolutely endless. His divinity, the incarnation, his sacrificial death, our eternal life. The books would be endless. And he closes with amen. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention for a moment <coughs> back to verse 22. It's in verse 22 that Jesus uh, now speaking to Peter, says, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. I think that's the key issue in every single one of our lives. I think that that's the key issue in every Christian's life. You follow me. How are you doing at following after Jesus? And and that was really the issue that was at hand, was Peter following the, the Lord. There had been a lot of distractions, a lot of concerns. That last year, the life of Jesus, from Peter's perspective and the disciples, it was a year unlike any of the other years that they had ever experienced. The popularity of Jesus in that last year just started to explode. It started to erupt. Wherever he went, the crowds were 
getting out of control. And miracles were off the charts. Jesus was touching and healing. And at the same time that the, the ministry was blowing up, at the same time the, the opposition was also increasing. And it was becoming clear that Jesus' life was becoming endangered by the religious leaders. And, and they come to Jerusalem and the whole city comes out and the triumphal entry and they are singing the hosannas as they are heading into the uh, the home court of the religious leaders and the Sanhedrin and and the next thing they know the conflicts are going on between those religious leaders and Jesus every single day of Holy Week and suddenly Jesus is arrested and scourged and crucified and dead and buried and it's done and we're next because we were his followers his disciples and then suddenly he's alive he's resurrected and tells us to head back to Galilee and what what does that mean what where do we go from here the turbulence the the ups and downs the twists the the, the total destruction and, and and then the rebirth and and now what what does it mean Jesus is now leaving us again he's going to his father and how do we what do does anybody have the plan and Jesus says to him Peter here's the plan you follow me that's the plan but what about John what's he going to do And what's going to happen? I have a lot of questions about all of the things that are going on. Do you see everything that's going on around us, Jesus? Here's the plan. You, follow me. That's the plan. I think this last year has been a year unlike anything we've ever experienced in our nation. tumultuous gyrations that have gone on in our nation on so many different levels. Just the political level alone. We had an election unlike any election we've ever experienced in the the history of our nation. And people began talking in politics and in the news and the tweets and the Facebooks and it became consuming and overwhelming and And I feel like Jesus was asking a question. Are you talking about me anymore? Or are we just getting consumed with the events that are taking place over here? Just follow me. Our nation didn't just have a tumultuous and political events that took place, but huge social issues that took place and erupted across our nation. It was on everything. It was on social media. It was on the news. It was everywhere. Everybody was engaged in, in all of this that was taking place in our nation. And there's the Lord saying, just follow me. Have you forgotten about our relationship? Have you got so swept up in everything that's going on in the world around you that you have forgotten about me and about just us? But Jesus, look at what's going on in our name. Just follow me. We didn't just have political upheaval and social upheaval. We had a pandemic on top of everything else that was going on. And all we saw on the news every single day, number of people infected, number of people mm, die, 
We're going to open up. Nope, we're closing back up again. We're wearing masks. You need to stay distance. You need to isolate for this amount of time, that amount of time. You can go. You can't go. And, and all that there was was just all of the COVID. We were just consumed uh, with COVID. And there's the Lord saying, just <laughs> follow me. But Lord, where is this all going to go? And when are we going to be able to all return back to normal? When aren't we going to have to wear our, uh, our masks? And, and all of these questions that stirred in our hearts and have us anxious and, and all. And there's the Lord. <laughs> but Lord, what about all this stuff? And, and there's the Lord just saying, just follow me. We didn't have just political upheaval and social upheaval. We didn't just have a, a pandemic on, on top of that. Let's add into it the economic hardship. People were losing their jobs, losing their businesses. They were being laid off. They were losing their houses and the economic hardship on top of layered, on top of everything else. And Lord, do you see everything that is going on? This is such a mess down here and there's the Lord saying the exact same thing to us as he said to Peter when everything was all a catastrophic mess and Peter wants to know the, the plan and he wants to know about John and, and everything else that's going on and Jesus says this just just follow me. That's the plan. You see, Jesus said, in this world you will have what? Troubles, tribulations. Have we had troubles and tribulations this year as a nation? Would you say that that fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus when he said that? So, so here's what I want you to know. While we had no idea what last year was going to entail, you know who wasn't surprised one bit about the events that unfolded last year? God. Sovereignty of God. He knew all of them. Jesus said, you're going to have tribulations. You're going to have them. And we're not going to be able to control what we can't control. Amen? We're not going to be able to control COVID. COVID is going to be what COVID is going to be. Things that are going to happen in our nation, they're, they're the things that are going to happen in our nation. You're not gonna be able to control. You, you can do what the Lord asks you to do, your part, whatever that is. That's part of following him. You follow me, just follow me. And that's the word that the Lord is speaking to us today. Don't be concerned about all, oh, don't let your heart be troubled. He said, in this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's right. And he says, just do this. Just follow me. And as we follow him step by step, do you know where he's leading us? Home. Home. Day by day, step by step, that's where he's leading you. But Lord, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord, shh. Just follow me. We're heading home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but Lord, we know that we can trust you to just simple follow you. I thank you that we don't have to have the answers, Lord, and that you don't give us the answers. You don't lay it all out for us, and, and, and Lord, into the minutia. You just simply say, follow me, and you lead. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us, that, that we wouldn't be distracted from our relationship with you, that we wouldn't stop praying and stop reading the word and stop studying the Bible as we become consumed with the tumultuousness of the events that are going on around us, but that, Lord, we would remember to keep the first thing first. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and then love others. And that's what following 
after you means. So Lord, forgive us if we have lost our focus. Forgive us if we have stopped spending the time and focusing on our relationship with you, if we have been swept up. But Lord, this day, just like with Peter, you put his feet back underneath him. You stood him back up again. You reoriented him. Just follow me. So Lord, bless us and help us to just follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.